Hello, and welcome to part two of this incredibly nerdy journey that I've decided to go on for some reason. In this ridiculously long series, we're going to be breaking down CinemaSins to their very core to assess their writing quality. So without further ado, let's jump on right into it. That, that was, those words were in the wrong order. Yep. Now before we pick up where we left off, this is of course a part 2. If you haven't seen part 1 yet, I would recommend watching that first, since in that I provide context as to what it is I'm actually trying to achieve here. I also did say I'd be using this video as an opportunity to correct any mistakes from part 1, and there are a couple, so I'll be doing those at the end. But other than that, I think we're ready to just pick up where we left off. It's time for sin number 15. So when we left off, Jeremy was talking about the Infinity Stones, and for his 15th sin, he asks this about them. Also, why six? That's it. That's the whole sin. Now, you can't really say that this is factually wrong, because it's just a question. However, the question doesn't seem to be here to benefit a joke of any kind, nor does it draw attention to any kind of issue with the filmmaking. It's been made abundantly clear within the MCU that each stone represents a fundamental aspect of existence. Now, of course, there are a lot of ways to divide up sort of existence as a whole. You could do it based on states of matter, fundamental particles, fundamental forces, whatever. But uh, this is the way the MCU decided to do it. And it's based on fictional science, yeah. And you totally could argue that the way they divided up seems completely arbitrary. Wait, so there's like mind and soul? So there's like two stones for like, for like beings. But then you've got like time and space. Wouldn't, wouldn't everything just be covered by time and space? Like, like how is a mind not a part of time and space? And then you've got reality as well. Like how is, how is literally not everything else covered by reality? Isn't reality fucking everything? What? Isn't space a part of reality? What the fuck? Unfortunately for CinemaSins though, the movie definitely has an explanation. If they don't like the explanation given, then they should, you know, address that instead of just going, why six? This isn't a question that draws attention to a problem with the film, rather a question that draws attention to the ignorance of CinemaSins on the topic. You know, this is equivalent to me watching Rogue One and saying, so why is there a hole in the Death Star? It wouldn't be a joke, nor would it be valid criticism. If you did want to defend this sin, I'd say the best way to do it would probably be to argue that when Jeremy says, why six, he's referring to the actual explanation we're given. He's not saying, why are there six stones? He's saying, why are there six fundamental aspects of reality in this continuity? However, I would say that arguing that would be a massive stretch when you consider context, because he's very clearly talking about the actual stones themselves. Although, if you really do want to interpret it that way, I'm not going to stop you. I don't think that's what he was trying to say, but that's the best I've got. I'm not inside his head, I don't know that that's not what he was actually going for. But in short, there's technically nothing factually inaccurate about this sin, but the implications of it are highly disagreeable. It's time for number <laughs> Two weeks ago, Vision turned off his transponder. He's offline. Okay, if he had a f***ing transponder and knew it, he wouldn't have waited until two weeks ago to turn it off. So this is some bullshit bullshit here. So this is a sin that simply begs the question, why not? As a result of the format that CinemaSins have created, it's not up to them to prove that the things they're saying are true. Which would be fine if they were trustworthy. But let's actually take a look at Vision's situation. When we last saw him in Civil War, he was just starting to get cosy with Wanda. Then we don't see him on screen for two years until Infinity War, where we learn that him and Wanda have very recently decided to run away together. We're led to believe that this is the reason he turned off his transponder. Now, since we haven't seen them for so long, we simply don't know what it was they were doing, which means that when the writers tell you, oh, two weeks ago they ran away together, that's believable, because it doesn't contradict anything. There's no information we have that would suggest any reason for this not to be true. Plus, in Civil War, Vision was on Team Tony. He was in favour of the Sokovia Accords and superheroes, I'm sorry, I mean ENHANCED PERSONS, being monitored. This would put his motivation in line with him being willing to keep a transponder on. Unless he suddenly decides that he wants to run away with someone because he loves them. Basically, despite the fact that it's limited, all the information we are given goes against the point CinemaSins is trying to make. In short, they are wrong. But they call it some bullshitty bullshit. This is some bullshitty bullshit here. So, what do I know? Me sitting here looking at the evidence. Sin number 17. 
Cap and I fell out hard. We're not on speaking terms. Really? What was that letter Cap sent you at the end of Civil War then? He specifically said, if you need me, I'll be there. Now, my initial reaction to this sin is to say that that doesn't in any way mean that they're on speaking terms. We're not on speaking terms. You know, that's the actual statement being disagreed with here. The fact that Steve left Tony a phone for emergency situations doesn't mean they're on speaking terms. Are you Tony's stank? Tony just said there that they're not on speaking terms, and yeah, they're not. If he needs him, he'll be there. That's not like that's not speaking terms, really. Chat. Call me when you. Yeah. yeah. If you if you call desperately me, need baby. me and the world is in danger, call me. That's not. Hey, just just we'll have a chat whenever you know. Hey man, want to get burgers downtown? <laughs> <laughs> if you need me for burgers, I'll be there. <laughs> However, this We're not on speaking terms. is the excuse that Tony gives to not contact Cap, despite the fact that he now knows the severity of the situation and that the world is in danger. When you watch the full scene, Tony saying they're not on speaking terms feels more like an excuse. If Tony called Cap now, it wouldn't be him going, I need you for burgers. It would be him saying, help me save the world from Purple Man. Meaning that Tony's behavior in this situation totally is questionable. He should know that the world is at stake and he should know that means he can contact Cap. Unfortunately for CinemaSins, this is another case of if that's what they meant, that's what they should have said. The statements they call into question are Cap and I fell out hard and we're not on speaking terms. If you take this in literally, these are the statements being disagreed with, which is unfortunate because both of them are true. Really? What was that letter Cap sent you at the end of Civil War then? He specifically said, if you need me, I'll be there. However, unlike the Y6 sin, I find the charitable interpretation of this sin to be much less of a stretch. I'm happy to believe that when Jeremy says, really? That he's trying to draw attention to the fact that Tony should know in this situation that Cap would be willing to take his call, and that he just didn't phrase it very well. That said, I think that interpreting what's being said here as, they are on speaking terms, Cap gave him a phone, uh, is completely valid because, well, that's how he frames it and phrases it. I'd rate this sin as ambiguous at best, with the ambiguity being between one interpretation that makes sense and one that really doesn't. Basically, this sin could be okay, but you'd have to give Jeremy the benefit of the doubt as to what he actually means by it. Sin adult number. That's it, all of the rest of the sins are 18 plus. Uh, so if you're a minor, you're, you're not allowed to watch the rest of the series. I'm sorry. All these dudes are superheroes, and they all sense something sinister is happening outside. But instead of instantly leaping into battle, they take several seconds to gape like children at the strange noise, like dickheads. Now, as far as humor goes, I'd say you definitely could call this observational comedy. So there's, there's a joke here. It's also a joke based on criticism, criticism that is arguably valid. They definitely could have been faster to respond in this situation. Like, they sense that something's wrong, they don't... Yeah, they, they, they hear a noise do? and they're like, what's that noise? You they don't, don't spread to every single noise. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. imagine oh, if, like, noise. the floor creaked and that Asian was just like, I got it! He <laughs> Die, floor! And... Die, floor. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a weird complaint. Like, it's literally, like, windy, isn't it? They only go outside where they start seeing things that are quite big moving through the wind. They're like, oh shit, something's going on. Like, imagine Iron Man suits up and he, like, busts out of his house <laughs> and then it's just like Pepper was drying her hair with a hairdryer. It's like, oh. Now, what I will say is that watching this scene back, they definitely could have been faster to respond. It's nothing drastic, it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, but now that it has been pointed out to me, I do notice it. You really don't get any kind of sense of urgency from our heroes, even once it's apparent that there's definitely something wrong. However, considering what we know about these characters, would we expect them to react to danger by running straight into it immediately without hesitation? Well, the main interest that Strange and Wong have is to protect the Time Stone, so they'll be considering what the best way to actually do that is. It makes sense that their reaction to danger isn't to run headfirst into it. Then we have Bruce, who we know considers the other guy to be a dangerous liability more than anything. It totally makes sense that his immediate reaction when confronted with danger, especially when there are civilians involved, wouldn't be to throw himself into that situation. Which leaves us with Tony, who, while you could argue it's reasonable for him to hesitate, he would most likely be motivated to try and help people without delay. I'd say you could argue that Tony should have been faster. So, in short, this sin can only really be applied to one of the four people Jeremy is attempting to apply it to. It ignores what it would actually make sense for these characters to do, and mostly falls flat as a result. Hey, that's the age that I am. I'm 19. The alien ship causes Peter's spidey sense to go off, and Homecoming didn't give us any indication spidey sense even existed. And now this movie is just thrusting it on me like, well, almost like they forgot it was a thing and are only now implementing it. This one comes so close, so close to being right that it's almost aggravating. 
I, I just want it to be right. Now, if this one is right insofar as when we look back at Spider-Man Homecoming, Spider-Man doesn't seem to really have any kind of Spidey sense. If he did, you know, stuff like this wouldn't really have happened. So Jeremy is drawing attention to a real inconsistency here. The only problem is this line right at the end. Oh, almost like they forgot it was a thing and are only now implementing it. Almost like they forgot it was a thing. Yeah, exactly. It's not present in Spider-Man Homecoming, but it is absolutely present in Infinity War. This appears to be an inconsistency, because if he has Spidey sense, things like this shouldn't have happened. Alright, let's move on to and are only now implementing it. This, unfortunately, is inaccurate. Spidey sense has previously been seen in the MCU, in Civil War. Oh god. So, only now implementing it wouldn't in fact be true. I'd say this is probably a result of the Russos doing both Infinity War and Civil War, but not doing Homecoming. But the why isn't really important, I just wanted to show off the fact I'd done my research. Now, fortunately for CinemaSins, this isn't an error that makes the entire sin fall flat. It's just one of the smaller details within the sin that's wrong. It's a mistake they shouldn't really have made because they've done Civil War, but... You know, the sin still works overall. It highlights a genuine inconsistency between two films. Unfortunately, it just doesn't take a third one into account. I need you to cause a distraction. Holy <laughs> We're all gonna die! Ned, you are a treasure. Basically, he likes Ned. Yeah, that's fine. I like Ned as well. Uh, he can like whatever he likes. He can dislike whatever he likes, so long as he's not, like, arguing for it with faulty logic or by misrepresenting something. But yeah, this one's fine, let's move on. Sin number 21. Maybe none of the classmates on the bus see Peter do this, but plenty of other drivers and passengers on this bridge do. And in the age of smartphones and dash cams and government surveillance, this transition was definitely seen and captured on film and Peter's cover is blown forever. Okay, let's examine this one. First of all, Peter's only on the side of the bus without his mask for a split second. He's certainly not there for long enough for anyone to get out a cell phone and start recording. So phones are out of the question and it was kind of dumb for you to bring them up as a possibility in the first place. It's almost as if you're trying to make your sins sound more convincing by adding like fake bullshit evidence that doesn't make sense. Uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that you would do something like that, uh, mostly because I, I don't think you care enough. When we move on to dash cams, that's definitely more of a possibility in that it is a possibility. But we do have to consider that the only drivers that are going to be able to see Peter's face are the ones going the opposite direction to him. So they'll only have got a split second of footage of his face while they were moving in the opposite direction of him on a camera that's probably of this kind of quality. Look, there are a few people standing around in this footage. Do you think you can identify them? Jeremy also says that this was definitely captured on film, which, like, it wasn't. I mean, sure, it could have been captured on film, but to say it definitely was is ridiculous considering that not everyone has dash cams. And even if it was, there's no guarantee you're going to be able to identify Peter Parker from that footage. Some of them might have been distracted by the giant fucking spaceship hovering over the city. That's another that fair point. No, but there's a boy on that bus. <laughs> I mean, what's more shocking, Spider-Man jumping out of a bus or a giant flying donut over New York? I mean, what you, um, to tr the most benefit of the doubt, Rags then pulls the bus over or follows it to the thing and then goes, who on this bus is not accounted for and who was at the beginning of the ride? And then they go, uh, Peter Parker? And then you go, <laughs> I know who Spider-Man Very Spider interesting. Is. This wouldn't Maybe. blow well, his well, cover. What would it matter? <laughs> This Half is the thing. of them die anyway. We can't even, that's actually another really good point. <laughs> Nobody would care because everyone is dust. Sin 22, 22, do, 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 do. What's the matter with you kids? You've never seen a spaceship before? Yeah, sure. They've seen a spaceship, and it usually means bad things. I've seen a tornado before. That doesn't mean that when it happens, I'm going to sit on the bus reading Madame Bovary. Now, what he's sitting here clearly is a joke, but he comes back to it with a joke, so I'd say that's absolutely fine. And technically, none of what he says is inaccurate. The worst thing you could accuse him of doing here is missing the point of the joke. But this does come across as him just riffing off the movie rather than suggesting there's actually something wrong with it. What I will say though is the fact that he sent a Stan Lee cameo within a month of the man's death does strike me as a bit off. I would consider the most likely explanation of this to be that CinemaSins created this video in advance and then just sort of sat on it until the Avengers Endgame trailer dropped. 
so that their releasing of their video could coincide with the Avengers Endgame hype. I can prove that they do that if you want me to, that's just not what this video is about. It seems to me that if they made this video after the passing of Stanley, they would probably have said something else. But hey, maybe not. They have straight up added sins just because someone has died before. Goodbye, Dumbledore. Hope you don't look and sound completely different next time I see you. So, you know, who knows? Maybe they just felt like that was a good idea. Either way, it kind of strikes me as tone deaf, and it didn't go down particularly well with their audience. But I wouldn't say there's anything technically wrong here. I just think they made an unpopular decision. Sin number 23. Yep. Bring me the stone. Dude, a minute ago you were making metal fly with a flick of your wrist. Why do you even need the futuristic space axe dude to do this for you? I'd like you to imagine for a second that the Moor didn't say that. That instead of sending Big Crocodile Daddy, that's actually his name, I, I googled it, the Moor went ahead and tried to get the stones himself using his telekinesis. Jeremy could just as easily say, why is he bothering to get the stones himself? He's got that big crocodile dude who could easily just do it for him. Because here's the thing, we don't really know much about these characters. Daddy Crocodile appears to be subservient to Squidward, so is there any actual reason that he shouldn't send Crocodile Daddy ahead? Or did you just want to make another comment knowing full well that you wouldn't have to actually justify it to anyone? The more deciding on this plan of action doesn't contradict anything else we find out in the film. And although I'm perfectly happy to acknowledge that it's subjective, I do think that qualifying this as comedy would be a stretch. This is yet another sin based on just a lack of information, and it's not information the film needed to provide us. An equivalent comment could be, why does Thanos need to use the Infinity Stones? Are you really telling me that there's nothing else in the universe that could do the job he needs to do better? And while it totally is possible that there's something in the universe more powerful or easier to obtain than the Infinity Stones, by having Thanos go after the Infinity Stones, the movie is telling us that they're the most effective solution that he's found. And since that doesn't contradict anything within the text, there's no problem with the movie telling you that. So cut back to Squidward sending Croc Daddy ahead, maybe there would be other courses of action that these characters would favour. However, the movie is telling us that they favoured this course of action, and we have no reason not to believe the movie in this case. Unless, of course, you want to pad the runtime of your nitpick show. The 24th of the Sins. I need a concentrate here for a second. Bruce's Hulk transformation troubles become an impotence metaphor. And does that mean when he's successful, it's like he's a huge green boner? And what does that say about his character? That he can only become erect when he's angry? This is the most embarrassing Mark Ruffalo's been since In the Cut. Okay, so this is clearly just here as a joke. That's all fine. It's clearly not trying to make any kind of point about the movie, so let's just move on. Yeah, on the subject of Hulk's boner, I think of how big that dick is. That was an important comment. If this Sins video was December, we'd have made it to Christmas. I don't know if there's there's anything you could really do with that information, but you know, there you go. I realize that nanobots are legit real world science, to a degree, but Tony Suit is applying it in ways that make it utterly unbelievable. So let's start this one off by pointing out that whether or not something is believable is entirely subjective. And that's absolutely fine, at least within the standards that I'm assessing the quality of this video by. There's nothing wrong with a subjective comment, and more than that, a subjective comment can't really be incorrect. You know, when they say, I didn't believe this, I can't really go, Yes, you did! But now we've established that the claim can easily be interpreted as subjective, let's actually look into it to see if I agree with it. Even if something is subjective, it can still be highly questionable. If Jeremy was playing Halo Reach and said, I find it completely unbelievable that a planet would have this much water on it, you could just be like, the Earth has, like, more water than that, so... Why do you- what the fuck are you talking about? Let's start by taking a look at other technology within the MCU. Considering the fact that the MCU isn't set in the real world, it's set in an alternate timeline, we need to consider whether or not things are realistic by comparing it to other things in the MCU. In the same way that you shouldn't criticise Star Wars by saying, the Force and lightsabers aren't real, because within that world, they are. You know, this is one of the reasons that people create fictional universes in which to tell stories. It opens them up to more possibilities. Like, like, woman trampolines. Now, we know that in the MCU, technology has been far in advance of our own since World War II. While in Captain America, they clearly couldn't do everything that we can do in real life today, it was established that even back then, science could accomplish feats that we in the real world could only dream of. Nothing quite like or on the same level as nanobots, though. I do just feel it's important to note that in this universe, technology has been different from our own for a very long time. Then we fast forward to the first Iron Man film, and Tony is already building suits that we wouldn't be able to build in the real world. In Iron Man 2, he builds a suit that can sort of morph out of a suitcase. Then we move on to the Avengers, where there's like, an actual attempted alien invasion. The logical assumption would be that after our victory, humans salvaged some of the alien technology, and this was later confirmed in Spider-Man Homecoming. So, this is now a world where alien technology has influenced human technology. 
And honestly, who knows what that could have done for us? Especially considering that the Shatari seem to have made contact with all of the other alien races from the MCU we've been introduced to, meaning that logically the technology they use would be an amalgamation of all of the best kinds of technology produced by all of those species they're in contact with. Just like how different nations share technology in the real world. At this point, technology in the MCU gets even crazier, with the Vulture able to make insane stuff in his makeshift workshop. Tony's suits are getting pretty crazy at this point too. We've got this one that can literally go to wherever he is in the world in little pieces and then form around him. Still not at the level of nanotech, but you could definitely argue it's getting closer. Then fast forward to Civil War and then Black Panther, and Wakanda decides to share their technology with the rest of the world. Technology which is insane. But in fairness, that's technology that Jeremy also had complaints about. So if he finds that unbelievable, of course he's gonna find the nanotech unbelievable as well. Man, I love this Q-style tech introduction of the gadgets as much as anyone. But the use of vibranium totally bypasses explanation of how all this shit was developed. Like, it's basically, this is the greatest tech ever invented. Yeah, but vibranium forever! In short though, whether or not you find this stuff believable is a matter of opinion. Cinemasins seem fairly consistent in what they do and don't find believable, so that's all fine. I've just presented all the evidence to you, so you can decide whether or not you agree for yourself. I find it kind of iffy, but it's okay if they think that. This isn't anything wrong, but it isn't right either. It's a completely subjective comment, and that's okay. 26 is actually the number of accurate things CinemaSins have ever said. Here's some shit we definitely won't use later when it could sway the fate of the universe. I mean, there are much more important and dangerous hands that this can be used for to cut off in this film. It is completely accurate that Doctor Strange has loads of powers that we don't see him try to use against Thanos in this movie, and I would consider this to be a flaw. So many of the actual criticisms I've seen thrown at Infinity War have been things along the lines of, why didn't Doctor Strange just do X? For instance, we're given no actual reason that his final solution he used against Dormammu wouldn't work on Thanos. Now, we do get an awesome scene where Thanos just sort of punches his way through the mirror dimension. Did Thanos just punch through the mirror dimension? Which does go a long way in showing that not all of Strange's tricks are gonna work on Thanos like they work on other people, but there's definitely still a case to be made that this isn't enough. Now, my initial reaction to the sin was to say the only reason that this dehandification worked on Crocodile Daddy was that he willingly put his hand through the portal. Thanos never does this, so how could they dehandify him? But then, after doing some research, I remembered that Doctor Strange can straight up move or throw his portals. So it seems like with that considered, this is at least something he should have attempted against Thanos. Thanos could then have just done the equivalent of punching through it, but without Doctor Strange attempting this, we have what is essentially a loose end. So this is a completely fair sin. But after that one, it's now 27. They've, they've got 27 things right. Unlock 17A. Thank f***ing God Stark had pre-designed and built and voice programmed for deployment a space-worthy Iron Spider-Man suit in the... I'm guessing a few months since Spider-Man Homecoming? I find this one pretty interesting, because it does have a couple of mistakes in it, but neither of them actually tear down the internal logic of the sin. They just sort of show how CinemaSins doesn't really care about accuracy. Their first mistake was to say that this built was suit after Homecoming? That was... I really, really nailed that. Their first mistake was to say that this suit was built after Homecoming, when... It's fucking in Homecoming? This is another mistake they really shouldn't have made because, well... Why would Tony go from, I need the suit back, to you're part of the Avengers after one heroic moment for Peter? He took the suit for Peter going after the Vulture. And then when Peter goes after Vulture again, boom, welcome to the club. He's still a 15-year-old kid. That's a bit awkward, isn't it? You've literally covered this scene before. But when it comes to Infinity War, nope, never seen that before. Now that sure does look like something that was built after Homecoming happened. <laughs> The second thing they get wrong is the amount of time between Homecoming and Infinity War. It's actually a matter of years rather than months. But hey, they even say themselves that they're guessing when they say that, so fuck it, I guess. Who am I to suggest that they take out the 30 seconds it would take to just Google it? If he has the measurements of Peter, then that's it. He just, he, surely he would be able to... But that's not really relevant because this suit was built and, and available in Spider-Man Homecoming and, and Jerry Wait, forgot. How did you get Peter's measurements? Because <clears throat> Peter is really surprised when he sees the first suit. Um, I don't know. I'm an... Tony's a uh, smart this man. Is, this is the real plot hole. Well, it's <laughs> possible that it's a one Tony size fits all, but it him. like shrinks down to his. Do we want to know Look, how Tony keep... measured him? <laughs> Do we want to know that? Other than that, though, it's pretty undeniable that the fact that Tony just sort of decided to build Peter a suit that could withstand the vacuum of space is a plot contrivance. 
It's not a ridiculously huge one or anything, but it does seem unlikely that Tony would consider Spider-Man going into space to be a likely eventuality. For that reason, I would say the actual point being made by the Sin is valid. Unfortunately, CinemaSins still manage to be wildly inaccurate with their delivery of it. Would you look at that? We're almost to 30. Sin 28. Friday, send him home. Yep. Um, why didn't the suit just fly him back to wherever Tony wanted him to go? If you're telling me that the suit doesn't fly, then why doesn't it? If the suit does fly, then there's no need for the parachute send-off, especially if you've got Friday controlling it. Why doesn't the suit fly? I don't think... I don't think Spider-Man needed flight when he made that, made that suit because of the whole web-slinging thing. Yeah, Mola, I also don't think Spider-Man needed to be able to breathe in space! I'm completely happy to agree that the grab bag of powers the Iron Spider suit has seems kind of arbitrary. We know that Tony easily could give it the ability to fly, but doesn't, and we're not given any kind of reason that he wouldn't. CinemaSins has actually been on a roll with these last few sins. While they've made some mistakes along the way, most of their last few sins have actually held up to logical scrutiny, so that's pretty cool. Of the last five sins, one of them's been a joke, two of them have been right, one of them's been right with a butt, and one of them's been subjective. Although, admittedly, that one with a butt has got a pretty big butt in that there are huge mistakes in it, but still, this is good for them. It's time for Sin 29, a number that has no particular, like, value or, or specialness. <laughs> Somehow after that massive battle that ended in that one park, Banner retraced his steps and found Tony's phone in the rubble. Like, a needle in a haystack called and thinks you're making this sh too difficult. This is another one that pretty much seems fair. That makes it six in a row, unless you decide not to include that one with the huge mistakes in it, which, you know, there definitely is an argument for not doing. While the fact that Banner is able to find Tony's phone isn't ridiculous, it's not something that would never have happened, it does seem like a mild convenience. In the scene leading up to the battle, Tony had the phone. We don't see what happens to it, and now in the scene after the battle, Bruce finds it pretty quickly. This is something you could call a minor plot contrivance. We're all good here, let's move on. Sin number 30. Well, this is 100% definitely not a reaction to CinemaSins complaining about text place names and movies being used when they're unnecessary. This is 100% definitely not a reaction to CinemaSins complaining about text place names and movies being used when they are unnecessary. Not much to say on this one. It's clearly intended as a joke. I mean, it's it's a weird and confusing joke. Does anyone know what that means? I think... No, I got nothing. Uh, all I have to say is that this was obviously a joke. The, uh, I mean, the fact that they called space, space. I can't say I get what it is CinemaSins were going for with this one, but it doesn't seem to be some kind of inaccurate criticism, so that's fine. They better break this streak soon or I'm gonna, like, make a really boring series here. Of all the retro references to make, Groot is playing Defender. What a f***ing infuriating video game. Why is he even playing ancient Earth games anyway? Aren't there modern alien games to download from the nebula? They broke the streak! Hooray! The Guardians films have been very clear in showing us that not only did Star-Lord take a load of stuff with him when he was abducted from Earth in 1988, but that he also has an interest in collecting items from his home planet. It's called a Zune. It's what everybody's listening to on Earth nowadays. Which clearly explains why they have it on the ship. As to why Groot is playing that as opposed to some kind of more modern game, well, the fact that he's playing that doesn't contradict anything that we know about his character. It's fine for a character to enjoy retro games, we have no reason to believe that Groot wouldn't enjoy retro games, and the movie is telling us that he does, so why would you question it? I quite like video games myself, and enjoy playing modern ones when I can fucking afford them. I have an extensive Steam library of 26 whole games! But if you then saw me playing Tetris and said to me, Jay, why are you playing Tetris? Don't you have any modern games? I'd be like, I mean, I, I do, but... I like Tetris. Basically, this sin is pretty silly and doesn't really contribute anything at all. Well, except poorly founded criticism. That Thor is convenient and illogical, but I do love Fig Newtons. So there are two ways to interpret this one. The first is that Jeremy is saying it's convenient and illogical that Thor would have shown up here in the first place. This would be incredibly silly since the Guardians are only here responding to the distress signal sent out by his ship. And I'm only really mentioning it as an interpretation because I've seen other people make it. I don't think that this is what Jeremy is actually trying to say. The second interpretation that we'll actually be going with is that it's convenient and illogical that Thor slams into their windshield like that. That it's fine they found the wreckage, but they found Thor himself way too easily. This one is half true, going off of the way he phrased it. He describes them finding Thor in the way that they do as two things, convenient and illogical. It's undeniably convenient that Thor crashes into their windscreen. There were at least 16 whole dead people in the Asgardian ship. 
meaning that even if we assume there's a 100% chance someone is going to slam into the Guardian's windscreen, which obviously that isn't, that's, that's not how that works, there'd still only be a 1 in 17 chance that Thor crashes into their windscreen, making it convenient. It is not, however, illogical, it's just unlikely, and there's nothing illogical about something unlikely happening. If a character in a movie won the lottery, you could describe that as lucky, but you couldn't describe that as illogical. Unless, like, they won without playing or something, that would be illogical. But that's not really relevant here, so, uh, yeah, it's convenient, but it's not illogical. You were half right. I've actually nearly run out of trailer footage to put behind these, so I don't know what I'm gonna do after that. After that encounter with a sudden new alien being, Groot is still playing handheld video games. There comes a point when a parent's got a parent, and clearly no one aboard this ship ever did that. So Groot ends up like that affluenza kid in Texas, and everyone around him acts like, oh snap, he's such a bad seed, why didn't anyone do anything? This one actually has a lot in it to break down, so let's go ahead and actually, well, do that. Jeremy is saying that because Thor is on the ship, Groot should be doing something other than playing video games, and that the Guardians should be doing something to modify Groot's behaviour. And this is another sin that begs the question... Why, though? First and foremost, the scene where the Guardians were introduced in Infinity War leads us to believe that responding to a distress call like this is just part of a normal day for them. The Guardians deal with a lot of crazy shit, and that's essentially just their day job. A job that they are in the process of doing when they rescue Thor. So the question we need to ask is, would they have any reason to want Groot to stop playing his game in the moments after they've taken Thor on board their ship? Well, in a scene just before this one, they do tell Groot to stop playing his game. Group, put that thing away. Now, I don't want to tell you again. But Peter only says that after voicing his concerns that the situation they're going into might be dangerous, implying that that's his motivation for asking Groot to stop playing the game, so that he can pay attention if he needs to be vigilant. The next scene is them arriving at the distress call to find that the actual battle has already taken place. And in the next scene, they have an unconscious Thor on their table. They're no longer about to enter a mysterious, potentially dangerous situation. They've assessed everything. And while they don't have all the answers yet, they do seem to have reached the conclusion that there's no immediate danger. So why would they want Groot to stop playing his game now? Especially considering they're all busy, and as long as he's playing his game, he's not bothering them. This sin continues a long-standing CinemaSins tradition of pointing out things that characters are doing without considering whether or not they actually have reasons to be behaving like that. I love how he has the arrow, by the way. Like, if you guys did realize I was talking about Groot holding the game. Oh wait, when he <laughs> talks about Groot... You like on screen? He's referring to the on-screen character Groot. No, he's referring to Drax, the big purple guy. Oh, he that's fucked confusing. up the arrow. That's confusing. All right, that's it. I'm out of trailer footage. Who knows what the next clip I use will be? He is anxious, angry. He feels tremendous loss and guilt. So basically every single American then, or even every human, aren't we all anxious, angry, and feeling lost these days? Mantis's empath revelations are more obvious than Forrest Whitaker's in Species. Okay, so this one's clearly a joke and that's all fine, although I would like to say that as far as I'm concerned, I felt this joke fell completely flat. To me it came across as an almost fellow kids level attempt to seem relatable. So basically every single American then, or even every human, aren't we all anxious, no. angry, and feeling lost these days? Do you guys feel tremendous loss every day? No. Yes. I feel it every time, like, I finish my bag of Doritos. <laughs> don't, like, think well, of, don't think of the Doritos that you've lost, because really, you've gained them. But as I outlined in part one, whether or not I personally find a joke to be funny is irrelevant in this actual assessment. This is clearly an attempt at humor, it's not some kind of wildly inaccurate criticism, and humor is subjective, so just based on that, this gets a pass. <laughs> Who the hell are you guys? That's an awfully rude way to greet people you don't know. I once woke up in this room and this dude tried to do all this gnarly shit to me with these strange tools and I was like, who the hell are you? And he said, I'm your fucking dentist asshole. Dr. James Packer DDS was tough, but fair. This one is clearly another attempt at comedy with no real attempt at criticism within it. Although it does contain the logical hole that you probably already know your dentist. Yeah, but your dentist isn't someone that you don't know, so this entire line was irrelevant and a waste of everyone's time. So this one's clearly a joke, but arguably it does have a hole in it. Alright, now that's all the actual sins I'm gonna cover for today, but before I go, it's time to make some amendments to part one. AMENDMENTS! The first thing I have to correct from part one is that I missed a couple of jokes. Quite late in the video I say that there haven't been any jokes in the CinemaSins video yet, but it's been pointed out to me that things like this 75% of the MCU has been Thanos bitching about traffic on the freeway could be interpreted as attempts at humor, and I missed that in part one. In part one, I also agreed with this sin. Do normal people see this sh While I know New Yorkers are up on their Avengers knowledge, I'm not quite so sure they've been informed about the masters of the mystic arts. And while I was agreeing with it, I said this. Now, I do know that this is a world with like aliens and things, but I'm still pretty sure that a magic portal would at least constitute like a look 
from some people. Like, from at least one person, right? Now, obviously there I was implying that literally not one person looked at the portal, and I've been told in the comment section that apparently some people did, but not very noticeably. I looked at the scene more thoroughly and found some people who looked like maybe they were looking, although I still wouldn't consider the bystander reaction to be particularly realistic, so I'd say I still agree with this sin overall. The final correction I have to make is in regards to the sin immediately previous to that one. Tony Stark, famous Avenger, is running around Central Park and nobody's bothering him. This guy is more famous than any president or celebrity in history. In part one, I agreed with this. I cited the fact that no one looks at the portal either as evidence that this was probably just an oversight. And it may well have been something that the filmmakers didn't think about, but that doesn't make it unrealistic. I have been told that in New York, people are really used to seeing celebrities and tend not to bother them. I, I don't know if this is true. I'm not a New Yorker, I don't know if you could guess, but if it is, which I'm totally happy to accept as a possibility, that would make this sin a lot more questionable. Right, now that's all of the actual corrections I have to make to part one, but there is one thing I'd like to make a little clearer before ending part two. In part one, I said I agreed with this sin. Also, where's Valkyrie? Valkyrie should have at least been shouted out in this movie. Thank Odin Valkyrie got half my people away to safety, is all Thor had to say later. This sin is all good. It's not a joke, but it does express a legitimate concern shared by many of the fans. It doesn't come across as super serious film criticism, and it doesn't have to, that's fine. I mean, I, I would also like to know where Valkyrie is. After I said this, I had a few people disagreeing with me, citing the fact that the Russos had confirmed that Valkyrie was safe in an interview. However, interviews are supplementary material, and the information wasn't actually within the film itself. I would consider the perspective that this is information that should have been included in the film to be totally valid, and that's why I don't disagree with this sin here. And that's everything! I really do hope you've enjoyed part 2 of this series. If you have, I'll link part 1 on screen, and if you're watching this in the future, I'll link part 3 as well. Other than that, please do let me know if I've made any mistakes in this video so I can correct them in part 3. The point of this series isn't just to tear down cinema sins, it's to be accurate. But I'll see you on Wednesday for... Actually, I have no fucking clue what I'll see you on Wednesday for, but I'll see you on Wednesday. Oh, goodbye.